I didn't come here to fuck spiders. <laughs> Let's get started. This is uh, Switches Get Stitches, and it's the third episode. Uh, you might want to know what the first two episodes were if you missed them. Uh, one was a workshop at 44Con. 44Con uh, believed in the research very early and said, why don't you bring it to a small number of people and do it as a workshop. Then I took it to Chaos Communication Congress um, and had a lot of fun there. And I wanted to get these guys to join me uh, to bring in some, some different elements to the talk. And it's a talk focused on industrial Ethernet switches and breaking the management plane of those switches. So we've got the Siemens Scalance. Um, the GE Multilink, and over there, the Open Gear. Um, so that's what this is about, and that's the previous episodes. So, who are we? I'll let you guys go first. So, I'm Colin Cassidy. I've been a senior software engineer for 15 years, um, and then gave that up because it was a horrific job and decided to break stuff for a living. Uh, Rob Lee, so I was one of the guys you probably hate. I was in the government uh, recently, but I'm no longer. I got out two weeks ago, so I'm alive and a civilian again. And uh, I'm a researcher in the industrial control system community as well. And I uh, used to be a senior risk researcher at the Cambridge Center for Risk Studies until I started telling jokes at DEF CON. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Um, we expect you to be a DEF CON audience. We expect you to have a lot of fun. So there's two things I want you to make noise for in this presentation. One is private keys, when you see them on the screen or we talk about them. And the other thing is when you hear a vendor patch time story that you like, I expect you to make some noise. So, switches get stitches. Let's get started. The Scalance X family, uh, so this is X200 switches, X400 uh, um, switches, basically this is the one I worked on, right? Um, they have session IDs in their web interface. And we all know that session IDs are a good place to get started, see if you can do some session hijacking. As we said before, all of the vulnerabilities that we're talking about today are in the management plane of the device. So when you go to the website of the switch to manage it, uh, you get these session IDs. Now, any of you who do a bit of reverse engineering, does anyone in here reverse engineer? Good. I'm glad that there's a few people in here who can teach me something. Um, these vulnerabilities uh, should be pretty obvious to you, right? You see the CO and the AA, and you probably think to yourself, that looks like a local IP address, right? Um, but you'll also notice that they're strictly increasing. So these session IDs uh, are increasing only. They're, they're not as random as they could be. So if you don't mind uh, flipping to the next, um, you can see that the ones on the right-hand side, if you pull the device every second, it will actually give you uh, incremental session IDs. And when I compared that with an SNMP request for the uptime of the device, uh, I discovered that it was indeed uptime in hex. And then I got confused because I checked the IP address at the front of the session ID, and it wasn't the IP address of the, uh, of the switch, right? So I kind of thought about it for a little while and then went, no, surely, surely they didn't. And of course it was my machine that was connecting to the device. So client uptime and sequential session IDs based on time uh, was one of the first vulnerabilities that we found here, weak, weak session IDs. Um, and I, you can sort of see in the mind of the developer here some sort of madness, right? Like, I know, I'll create all of the IP space and all of time, and that'll be impossible to ever estimate, right? But clearly it's a very uh, weak session ID. I actually go back one and I'll, I'll say one, more, one other thing. The bit at the top is essentially how the passwords were hashed on the wire. Um, so the admin at the beginning is obviously the user, password is the, is the clear text of the, of the password, and then you take that session ID that I just talked about and you use that as a nonce. Now the nonce, the number used once, is passed back and forth, and the idea there is that you can't replay a hash from previously, right? So that, that also probably affected why they used the uptime. Um, and there it is on the end. But, but you'll realize that by putting the, the password in the middle uh, in between these two colons and then MD5ing it, um, it's not a very large space to have to brute force. So you can snatch one of these IDs off the wire, one of these hashes off the wire, and brute force it uh, fairly quickly. Like 16 characters I think took um, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, something like eight characters would take a minute, right? Um, and then on top of everything else, it was MD5. So continuing a theme, the open gearbox here, 
um, also has a weak session ID. Um, essentially, it's the number in red. It's eight characters long. It's basically a hexadecimal value. It is semi-random. It doesn't increment. But beyond doing any more analysis above than that, we didn't really look into it much further. However, there was a nice configuration item built straight into the switch that allows you to extend it. So this one's already fixed, and it was fixed from the start. It's just not on by default. Um, and this highlights some of the problems with these switches is that they're not always deployed in the most default hardened state. Some of these reasons are to do with um, backwards compatibility. They've been deployed in the field with this previous state. And in an, the ICS world, they tend to be very risk averse. If there's one less thing they can test and just do a quick swap, that makes their life so much easier. All right. So after finding these issues with the session IDs, you can do some side jacking on a switch, um, both on the open gear or the Siemens Scalance. But if you, you know, if you work regularly doing pen testing, you'll realize from an operational point of view, this is not the greatest attack. Like, how often do you guys log into your switches? So I have to wait for that to occur, right? That's probably going to happen uh, every couple months at best, maybe once a year. So we didn't like those attacks. So we wanted to, we wanted to go for something a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, robust in terms of being able to use it any time. So we were focused on authentication bypass and particularly on firmware. If you go over to my GitHub, you can pull down this script. And basically, this is a CSRF, right? But the CSRF is, uh, a, it makes it possible for you to download a configuration file or download the log file of the device. Uh, that would just be a get. Or if you do a put, then you can put the firmware or you can put um, the configuration or the log file. And I find this kind of amazing, right? Because you can change the log file on a device before you've even broken into it. Um, and this creates uh, an authentication bypass in the sense that I can have a known good configuration with a password that I know. And the passwords are sort of hashed in those files, by the way. And I take that known good one, well, before I use the known good one, I download the configuration of the device, right? So I have the passwords that used to be there. I upload my own configuration. I log in with my password, which might be finely waxed mustaches or something, and then do whatever I want with the device, and then re-upload the old config. And no one's the wiser that the password has ever been changed, right? So this forms a, an authentication bypass on the device. And it's also brilliant that you can just post a firmware image um, to the device. So Siemens have fixed this in newer versions. Um, but if you do pen tests in this environment or you have access to these switches, feel free to download the script and prove to yourself that those versions were vulnerable. I think this one's you. So I essentially got involved in this project about a month after joining my firm, I'm active. Um, and Aaron said to me, I've been breaking these switches. Do you want to take a look? I said, OK, fair enough. He said, we've got the latest version of the firmware, download it and take a peek and see what you can find. So the tool of choice, more often than not, is Binwalk. It's a nice wee tool. It basically looks through an entire binary, looks for sort of headers of particular, of particular file types. In this case, we can see there's a large compressed file. Um, and so you can use Binwalk to essentially pull it apart. So taking the large compressed file, we can see that the first four items there. Closer? Is that better? Sorry. So we can see that the first four items there uh, relate to the certificate and private key of the, of the Siemens Scalant. And indeed, there it is. <laughs> so we reported this to the vendor, as you do, because you know we're nice like that. Um, and the vendor came back and says, yeah, but you can change it in the web interface. Uh, OK, that's fine. Where in the documentation do you say you have this key that needs changing? Otherwise, that's just like an undocumented login password backdoor. OK, we'll change the documentation. <laughs> so it was self-signed certificate. It can be changed by the web interface. Nowhere was it in the documentation. So um, guess what? Vulnerabilities in these devices tend to be pretty common and pretty in the same style, in the same pattern, right? Default credentials default keys, um, all of the OWASP top 10 are in there. And that's important, actually, because we like to do a bit of embedded, and we like to do binary analysis, and we're teaching ourselves to be better reverse engineers. I'm just looking at ECOS at the moment, trying to build flirt signatures and stuff. But we didn't want this talk to be like that. 
we wanted this talk to say, look, if you do web app pen testing, every embedded device now has an embedded web server. And some of those classic OWASP top 10 are enough to get you control over the device. So we could use your help if you want to come and look at embedded. Yeah, you need to learn some stuff about control systems and hang out with some engineers, but frankly, that's really good for you. They tell some of the best jokes, as you heard earlier. Um, <coughs> and in this particular device, I had to figure out how it was compressed. Um, I carved out a firmware upgrade. Actually, it's worth backing up a little bit. Someone sent me a PCAP, right? There are various engineers who know that I work on this stuff, and they'll send me sometimes anonymous letters, sometimes not anonymous letters. And one of them sent me a PCAP of the firmware upgrade of this device, right? And said, you know, here's this HTTPS traffic, but then once we do the firmware upgrade, it goes over FTP. And it uses the same credentials. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and uh, he was like, this is pretty bad, right? And I was like, yeah, actually, let me look at the rest, right? So um, I basically used TCP trace and I carved out all the files. And one of the files was much bigger than the other and it was over FTP, right? So now I have a copy of the firmware image from just from the, from the PCAP. And um, I looked through it and Binwalk didn't recognize a lot of it because I hadn't uh, recompiled it and upgraded it and some other things. So I had to figure out that a section of it was compressed, which you can do using entropy and other stuff. And then I you know, ran a little script over it to figure out um, where the compression lied uh, and managed to decompress it and found a ROM image. And inside the ROM image, there are these private keys, right? And I know you guys like private keys, right? Everyone has a private key collection? Yeah. So these are these private keys, the, the first one um, is for the HTTPS interface, which has just been ruined anyway because you've seen the credential go over in, HT, uh, sorry, in FTP, uh, at least if you've ever witnessed a firmware upgrade. But if you don't witness a firmware upgrade, you can take the key from the ROM image that I just described and install it in Wireshark and you can read all the traffic. And the passwords underneath are unhashed. So you get those as well. And I think this is a really key Sorry for the pun there, that was entirely accidental. But uh, <laughs> I think this is a real key issue in the sense that once, if you only have one encrypted interface on a device and someone breaks that, you now don't have a secure channel in which to upload new keys if attackers are persistent on your network. And I think that's an issue. Um, the second key uh, belongs to SSH but couldn't be enabled on the device and another researcher has since uh, brute forced the key because I couldn't be bothered. So the password on that is Magnum 6K, which is a little clue to something else that we'll talk about in a minute. Oh, I guess we're talking about it now. Um, <laughs> so it turns out that this switch is, you know, sold by GE, but it's manufactured by Garretcom. They make a line of switches called uh, Magnum 6K. So this key belongs to the Garretcom uh, switches in the same way as the GE key uh, belongs to the GE switch, right? So you basically just take a different firmware, you analyze it again, the key has changed, but it's, it's the same. And I should clarify that this, these particular keys affect seven out of nine of this switch family. So there's nine of them that are managed switches. Um, well, one of them is not managed, so therefore this, this stuff doesn't apply. Then seven are managed, and the biggest one has a different firmware image. So, you know, just, what, an hour or two of bin walk and, and fooling around a little bit, you pull these keys out and you get an authentication bypass um, for, you know, a couple thousand switches of a, of a switch family. Um, just continuing the thread on that. Um, whilst we found these keys in a GE switch and we reported it as such, um, it is a, essentially it is a rebadged Garrettcom. And so when you see the reports coming out saying there's issues with GE switches, uh, we don't know who else has rebadged these Garrettcom switches. So who else is affected? Is there a Siemens switch out there that's effectively a rebadged Garrettcom? And how does that essentially get out to the wider public? There's a sort of web of network vendors and rebadgers or resellers that it makes it hard to do proper sort of incident response and incident control in that regard. So flush with our success, pulling keys off Siemens switches and GE switches, um, we moved on to the GES, GE MDS Ys. Um, we don't actually have this switch, instead we just pulled down the firmware. This sort of in investigation sort of highlights the problem of not having the switch. What we found was not really problems. We went to GE about it and they said, no, they're not really problems. But we'll go through the process of what we found anyway, because it's interesting if nothing else. So Binwalk being our friend, 
pulls it down, is essentially a squash FS. Binwalk knows how to extract this stuff. And it happens to be a nice, essentially, Linux system, file system at the end of it. There's a search directory, so you can applaud that later. Um, but there happens to be a dot password file, which we thought was very interesting. And indeed, it contains the passwords and hashes. Um, uh, so, you know, it's got the admin one, it's got the guest, it's got auth code, which is used where if you forget the password and you need to reset it, you ring up GE and say blah, blah, blah. It's got a factory password, which was not documented, and it's got a root password that I got bored of waiting for Jack the Ripper to break. So, if anyone has a faster password cracking rig than me, take a note of it or find the firmware and go knock yourself out. Um, we did r r report this to GE, um, and they're guys rang me back. Um, I think I had one of their head product cert people and about their entire development staff. And they said, yeah, we looked at it. We don't believe it does anything. Now, I don't have this device to test that. So if anyone's got one I could borrow or can lay their hands on one and wants to find out, that would be ideal. But the other slightly bizarre thing is this is an industrial network switch. Why is there a games user? Oh, and they've got private keys too. Yay! Private keys for So yeah, key management in network equipment. You are going to find default keys all over the place. If they're undocumented, that is bad. If they're unchangeable, that is worse. We have not found unchangeable keys. However, other people looking at switches have. Self-signed keys are more of a more confusing issue. Yes, you have self-signed keys, but you lack the ability to revoke them. But if you're in an isolated network environment, that's fine because you shouldn't necessarily be connecting your industrial system to the rest of the world just so VeriSign can verify that you have the right certificate authority and key installed. No. So, but if you've got an internal one, you can probably get away with doing that some sort of thing. Um, these switches tend to lack the sort of processing power and any sort of entropy to create their own. But if you're going to set these things up, you will plug them into your laptop, and your laptop tends to have this sort of capability. So, to the vendors out there, maybe they need to consider a sort of initial step process that helps lock these things down from the start, rather than having one key that we can now talk to every switch on. That's not helpful. Essentially, the problem with key management is you have to manage your keys. You can't just leave it to the vendors or whatever crazy mechanism of just leaving it there. All right. So, um, you know, let's get back to some web app phones instead of some, you know, scraping, grepping keys out. Actually, this is a good, good story about that. There's a badass pen tester called Ilya Vance Brundle. And uh, I've spent a little bit of time with him, and I once asked him, you know, he does code review, how do you find so many vulnerabilities? And he said, I just grep for them. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know what? He's right. Like, if I'm going to write one script, for industrial control system devices um, that does something, what would it be? And it'd be like, grep for private keys in hex. <laughs> and it works. Um, so this switch also amusingly um, has a flash interface, if anyone's really into flash. Uh, I didn't explore that. I just went looking for cross-site scripting. And I hope that GE will forgive me for using that phrase in my proof of concept, but I was listening to DJ Qbert, and uh, that was a sample at the moment that I found the vulnerability. <laughs> so it just seemed appropriate. So there are eight types of cross-site scripting on the management plane of this device. Um, they also apply to Garrettcom. And you don't have to put them in specific parameters. I don't have to tell you which parameters to put them in, because you can make up parameters for the web server to put your cross-site scripting in. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. How are you? Very good. So we have a thing we do for people who have never spoken at DEF CON before. It is called shoot the noob. <laughs> don't worry. We won't actually shoot them. Don't worry. Jeffrey, I think they're familiar. How many of you are not familiar? One guy. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so I'm talking directly to you. <laughs> so, sir, were you born yesterday? Have you been to DEF CON before? No. Okay. 
Is that your real name? Yes, it is. What? Wait, what's your name? Ryan. And is that your real name? Yes, it is. We don't use real names at DEF CON. <laughs> <laughs> your, your hacker name is Aeropostoli. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> So, we're going to explain to Ryan, if that is your real name, <laughs> that uh, it's very hard to become a speaker at DEF CON. To get on this stage, you either have to be very smart or very stupid. <laughs> that, was, that was harsh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I really am. That was, that was uncalled for. He wasn't talking about you. You're the smart guy. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so... Uh, uh, just, a, just a quick toast for uh, our, our new speakers. Are they doing a good job? Yeah. Woo! And, and Ryan is up here representing all the, the new attendees. So thank you to DEF CON. Thank you. Oh, no, I'm, well, now you stuck your fucking thumb in it. I'm not using it. <laughs> oh, wait, the bear didn't get a shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, you guys got two minutes, and then you're done. Okay, right. okay. So then we'll have to make that uh, pretty quick. Um, so we promised to come up here and drop private keys like DJ Jackalope drops breaks. I hope you've appreciated that. Um, I think she's awesome. I come here to drink and dance, uh, and this is an excuse to do that, but I do have to do a lot of hard work for it, so let's go to the next slide. So GE firmware integrity. Um, remember earlier I didn't want to brute force that password that Ashish Campbell of Qualys brute forced? Um, the reason I didn't want to do that is because I can patch in my own keys in firmware and then run a CRC Adler uh, at the end, and then try and reverse the uh, algorithm at the bottom. So there's basically two checksums. One's, one's code signing more than checksum. Um, and if you patch in your own key with your own password, it turns out that just works, and you don't have to do any brute forcing. So top tip there. So this is one of my favorite vulnerabilities. Okay, um, Colin once asked me, why do you hack switches? And I said, because that's where the packets are. You know, paraphrasing. Dillinger, right? Um, but also, this is important because industrial system networks have a little bit of authentication and a little bit of crypto, but for the most part, they don't, right? Most of these protocols, if you can put packets on the wire, you can tell it to do something. Occasionally, you see something like a, they'll prevent a replay. But essentially, if you understand the protocol well enough, you can just tell it to do what you want it to do. And you can even perform things like recording ta traffic and replaying it, right? So once you have control over the switch, you can exfiltrate traffic. Now, that'll work in many environments, but on some real-time systems, let's say electrical, you have like 500 milliseconds of um, time in which to perform some of your attacks. So if you route your traffic halfway around the world to another country, you're going to fail to reach your timing constraint in that system. So you need to be able to alter the, the firmware to perform some of the process control um, in the style of Jason Larson or something. So then. I'm playing around with this switch, and before authentication to the actual web server, I find this DOS, right? Um, and essentially, there's a config file before you log in that you fetch. And I created a no cache parameter uh, and just, you know, incremented or randomized the number and requested this particular config file 2,000 times very, very slowly. And the web server of the switch rebooted, right? It was just initial fuzzing when I first started. And I thought, oh, it's a DOS. So what? DOSs don't matter. But they do really matter in industrial systems, particularly when the web server going down causes the switch to reboot for two minutes and all the traffic to be dropped in that time period. So this is the, the fix, the current fix from GE. Um, they had to go to Garrettcom and ask Garrettcom to fix it. And I think originally Garrettcom said, sorry, this is end of life, and now they've changed their mind, and now they're, they're patching it. But I, I want you to read that very carefully. Their mitigation is basically turn off the web server. I, I'm not too happy about that. I think we can do better as a, as a community. But how do you configure it now? Well, you would configure it through Telnet, which, as we all know, is an awesomely secure protocol. <laughs> so 
why does DOS matter? Why does DDoS matter? Um, in the ICS community, we try and be really good to each other and reference great work where we see it. You may have already seen the talk of uh, Marina Crotifol and Jason Larson. Amazing stuff. They dig really deep into the physics of damage and exploitation in industrial control systems. I stay a little bit higher up and, and try and work, focus on vulnerabilities and cost of attack. But basically, they showed in this paper that having a DOS in certain types of chemical process control is enough to give you almost complete control over the process. So go and look that paper up and you'll understand why we're trying to raise DOS as a much more serious vulnerability in industrial control systems. All right. So I'll do the first one. There was an old, old day, essentially, um, SSH username enumeration, if any of you remember it. I found it uh, when I first started looking at the open gear. It's worth saying, open gear gave me this switch, right? I met them at a conference and they were like, oh, you research switches, like, we'll give you one and you can test it and we'll get free testing and you'll get publicity and that's pretty cool, right? And I thought that was remarkable, especially in the ICS space. So they fixed it in one week, right? They patched this vulnerability in one week. Now I grant you, it's just an, a, 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 you know, a PAM configuration change, but still, um, GE took eight months to, to tell us to turn off the web server. Um, Siemens took three months um, to change some of their documentation and fix the CSRF. Um, so one week, I think, particularly deserves a round of applause in this space. Yeah, so I spent most of my time looking at the open gear switch, um, and it's out of the three, uh, out of the few switches we've looked at, it's probably the most secure default state. Everything we found essentially was post authentication. You had to be logged on to the to the switch to be able to do anything. Um, so it makes a lot of the whilst the impact may be high for some of these issues, the actual likelihood and realistic sort of impact is much much lower. Um, and in our conversation with Open Gear, they were upfront and told us when these fixes were planned, they had scheduled them all in, get them all worked, so they really did help us out here. But we'll carry on with the issues we did find. So that is the Open Gear switch. Um, it looks like that. It's that on the website. You can download the firmware. They also have a open development kit, so you can basically build your own firmware for these switches. So if Open Gear ever go out of business, you don't have to replace your hardware and you can keep things running over. So that's pretty cool. First issue, they have on their web page this nice support report which gives you all sorts of useful information. It's probably really tiny even though it's blown up there. But they have a link right at the top that allows you to download the support details for essentially offline viewing. Um, uh, but this page is normally only accessible by the root or admin user. However, you can directly navigate to the page as any user and pull down all the information. This includes things like the cron tab, the init tab, the entire syslog, a support text file, and that contains the IP tables configuration, the location of all the SSH keys, which becomes useful later on, um, the IP tables config, the, and the config XML file, which includes, contains all the usernames but no passwords. So immediate username enumeration, so you can pull, pull down the details of everybody else. The next issue they have, we found, was get file. And essentially this allows you to get any of the files on the device. Um, useful if you don't have SSH or Telnet access, but you can still essentially pull down any of the Linux files you've got there. So you can pull down their password file, which looks slightly more sensible than the GE password file in that it has no passwords in it and only contains sensible users. However, you can also download their private key. Yeah. Again, it's their default key. You can change it. It is documented. Um, and then we tr tried the traditional sort of cross-site scripting. Can we get cross-site scripting in place against this switch? No. Input validation denied. Um, you know, they've actually thought about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm as shocked as you are. <laughs> However, we decided, what about outbound validation? <laughs> So they have this config XML file. Uh, you can log on to the device and you can change a config XML file and basically just input your own XML that looks like HTML. And it executes. Oops. Um, but again, you know, cross-site scripting on these devices, but you have to already have sort of permission to do this sort of thing. So yes, it's nice and quirky, but realistically it's not the most brilliant of attacks. Um, however, this leads us to the last attack, which is essentially cross-site request forgery. So this is a burp suite dump of 
the sort of creating a new user. Um, and so this is all the bits. It's got all the parameters. It's a post request. So we mocked up a small web page that contains just that code that gives us essentially all these users. We've deliberately asked ourselves to give ourselves admin user. And if you can have somebody logged into the device and get them to navigate to your evil web page, you too can create your own device, you can create your own login backdoored onto the account. Um, and we can probably demo that if the demo gods are good to us. Can you make that look easy? Can I make that look easy? Come on. We'll find out. We'll find out. Um, so at this point in the presentation, you're probably wondering what the hell this guy's on stage for. So um, why don't we give him a little chance to explain that while Colin sets up the demo? Cool. Thanks. So mostly I stand up here with the good looking guys and it's good for my image, right? But uh, what I really like focusing on is the defensive aspect of it. So these two found a bunch of vulnerabilities, actually 11, right, in five different switch families. And at that point, if you're an industrial control system person, you're probably kind of depressed. So I'm the kumbaya defenses doable kind of person to talk about how attackers can take advantage of these things, but more importantly, how defenders can look for those things. So the unique thing about industrial control system networks, are you ready for the demo? I'm, I'm ah, all right, demos are more important, so do that first. Right, so this is uh, the essentially login page. We can, well, it's not the login page, but this is the users groups page. Um, and we can see down in the bottom we've got a root, a testing, and an admin user. Uh, the root is the default one, the testing and admin I've just created. Um, so our test script looks shockingly like that, which is exactly what we had in the first place. And so we're logged in, and in another tab, if we can have another tab, we can navigate to our evil page. Our evil page does stuff. It thinks for a while, thinks for a while. Please look. Song and dance, anybody? And we can go back to our user groups. And there's a new user. Yay! And it's admin. Yay! I uh, know, it was um, frighteningly so. But again, the, ty the ability to get that sort of timing attack is probably really low. Someone logged in as admin and you can get them to navigate to a page you control. You either have to have local control, a local network page somewhere, or they've configured their own device to connect to the internet and that's probably wrong. Um, so yeah, it's, it's you know, reasonably high impact but likelihood way down there. Um, so yeah. So in summarizing, it is a strong default state compared to their peers. Um, the issues have been thought about and they have remediated them. The session ID is a default thing you can just switch on. The configuration's there. They've got XSS input validation. They do have potentially high impacts but realistically low and it's all post authentication. None of this was pre-auth. And these people have essentially fixed these issues in what I like to call developer sprint time, so two to three weeks, compared to the vendor patch time of eight to nine months. And I think that deserves a big round of applause because these guys are on it. All right, back to defense is doable. Build it back up. All right. So there's a couple themes that go throughout the research. The first of which is as I was working with these gentlemen, looking from the defensive standpoint of trying to analyze the packet captures and what can we do for snort and bro signatures and things like that. Uh, there was an interesting amount of vulnerabilities they found and only 11 of them made it into the presentation because that's how many PowerPoint slides we could get through without killing ourselves. So when you look at it, there are huge issues in the community around these vulnerable in, uh, infrastructure. So if we see GE or Siemens or Open Gear, that's not the only ones that are bad, right? They're, it's across the industry and we're trying to make it better. But the second theme to come out of the research was we don't need the vendors, right? So we want the vendors to do better. That'd be great. But unfortunately, if it takes eight or nine months to make a patch, it usually takes another year or so to actually implement the patch in these facilities. So we don't want upwards of two to three years of vulnerable infrastructure where adversaries are trying to target these facilities. So we as a community, especially for those of you in the ICS community, can do a good job of monitoring for and defending these pieces of infrastructure without the vendor. So that's what I want to talk about a little bit. So one interesting aspect of industrial control systems networks that I really like is that they're fairly static. 
if you think of your enterprise IT kind of network, you have your users going to Facebook and LinkedIn and yeah, all sorts of weird places, right? In an ICS network that shouldn't exist, they should be relatively segmented networks. You should have multiple places to capture data on the environment, right? So this screen up here, an ideal network is you have your processes separated out from each other with multiple locations to capture data, but they're static. If they're using Modbus TCP, DMP3, OPC, whatever ICS protocols, that's the protocols they should be using on set ports. There should be relatively static uh, bandwidth usage in these type of environments. Now, unfortunately, we don't really usually do a good job with the networks. This is how a network should look like, and this is the typical layout when you walk into an ICS facility. It's all flat networks, unmanaged infrastructure, and nobody has any idea of what's going on in the facilities. So the downside with that is adversaries can get away with doing a whole heck of a lot without ever being noticed, because on the network it's really easy to spot. When we're talking about industrial network vulnerabilities, Adversaries would use that kind of thing, like why does it matter? Well, adversaries use that type of thing to learn the system, learn the process. There is no getting root on the PLC or the control system itself, that doesn't matter. If you're just on the network, you can do anything you want. All the protocols are unauthenticated, they give you the firmware, they pass information back, you can change control information, do whatever you want just by having access to the network. So the ideal set for any sort of national adversary or anybody in the government, right, that would want to get into these facilities across the world is to get the network. That's it. But we as defenders can see that. And I always find it interesting that there's these narratives that get built up about how amazing adversaries are, how amazing the, the quote unquote APT or whoever is. And it's funny because those are usually the government kind of positions. And as a former government guy, I think to, it's kind of interesting that folks think there's less PowerPoint and less bureaucracy in the government. So we actually aren't necessarily as good as people think we are. And uh, realistically, we can do a good job as defenders. So when you look into the ICS environment, there are problems. I want to note, yes, the vendors have good, good excuses sometimes about legacy equipment or uh, who owns the infrastructure. Is it the union? Is it the actual vendors themselves? Who can go and manage and patch these things? But they have to do a good job. So there are challenges, but we can mitigate those. So the first one I want to talk about is network security monitoring. Now, what I've done is I've thrown Habex up here as a quick example, and some of you are probably thinking, well, that's Wireshark data. What is Wireshark data doing in this talk? And realistically, after dropping 11 vulnerabilities on stage, I feel like we've earned the right to talk about basic security shit. So when you look at an ICS network, it's really easy to map it out, right? So pre Habex, this second piece of malware ever to specifically target industrial control system networks, is only the second one. When you look at what it does on a network, it's very easy to see it looking for ports and protocols and, and things that don't normally exist on that network. If you're inside of safety critical systems or inside of an ICS, you should know your network traffic. And it's very easy to spot these things. So from a safely capturing environment, so for, especially for the recorded uh, aspect when there's my ICS sisters and brothers watching in about what do we do in our facility, what can we do today without waiting on the vendor, you can go out and take basic tools, you can take Wireshark, whatever you want, and go safely capture data out of your environment. One of the things that I dislike is there's an, an atmosphere in the culture of don't touch it. If it's not broken, don't touch it. If the lights are on and the oil is pumping, please don't touch the network. And unfortunately, you can safely go acquire data, you can safely go acquire information and see the things that are going on. So a, as we mentioned during like, the press conferences leading up to this, there's high confidence that there are you know, folks inside of these facilities already. There is nobody taking down nuclear power plants or anything like that. But there's adversaries that are interested in that kind of thing. And we need to go collect the data. So again, especially for the ICS folks tuning in, we want you to make the infrastructure better. This isn't about shaming vendors. This is about saying we have a problem in the community and we can fix it. This is about raising that awareness. So threw up some tools in the, the slides. You can easily go through and look at it. There's YouTube and DEF CON and Black Hat videos everywhere about these kind of tools uh, and working through those. Uh, again, even just taking packet capture and learning the basic layout of your network can help. As an example, pre havex post havex IO, it doesn't look that simple, right, and then in, in terms of malware on the network. Yes, in the pre havex you have that nice little heartbeat, but post havex you don't. But in a static environment, it is really easy to see things like firmware modification. It's a giant spike in network data inside of an ICS environment. You do not have to be a trained security professional to do this. The interesting part is the process and the thought and the mindset that, that is that security mindset is very, very similar to a control system engineer, system architect, process guy. 
when you look when Aaron and, and uh, Colin had made this comment before on, in Black Hat, and that is that the same skill sets that these folks have looking for abnormalities anyways around alarming conditions and things like that inside the environment is the same skill set it takes to look for abnormalities in the network. It's just different sets of data that you have to look at. So today, your ICS engineers and, and architects can go through and look for threats without relying on the vendor. Just go back to the, to the previous one just for a second. Any engineers in the room? Excellent, right? So the point here being we're talking about doing change control using Wireshark. It doesn't have to be security stuff, but you should know if anyone tried to change the firmware. Not just sign a piece of paper that everyone in the facility agrees to not change the, the firmware unless they go and speak to Ted or Scott Adiva or whoever it is, but actually check the wire to see if these uh, upgrades are happening at times they shouldn't be. And I, I think there's something to be said for merging the idea of some security monitoring and your change control processes that already exist in the plants. All right, thanks. And so I, we're not going to go through and say, like, here's how to defend every aspect. I know that would probably be kind of boring for the audience. So there's going to be continuing research after this for those of you that are interested, papers, blogs, et cetera, about how to go through and mitigate these type of things, how to look for these uh, abnormalities in the environment. Um, but I threw this up here kind of as a joke. When we're, when we're looking at uh, security inside of ICS, it takes a whole lot of resources for an adversary to actually break in and do something neat inside of an ICS. When you think of that power plant or that nuclear facility, they're all unique. There is no just one vendor takes control of one area or there's no one network configuration. It evolves and it grows over time and it's unique. So an adversary has to spend a whole hell of a lot of time and a whole heck of a lot of resources to go in and learn what to do to even break or steal data or do anything interesting inside of an ICS. So if we just do our jobs inside those networks, I truly believe that ICS isn't this super vulnerable thing compared to IT. I think an ICS network is one of the most defensible networks that we have and we can actually do that security well. And to add to the kumbaya flavor, yes, IT and OT or operations technology need to start working together better. We need to have that ownership and bring the folks together, make the IT security folks talk to your OT folks and break down those barriers that are required to go out and identify these things. Because all of us want to have secure infrastructure. All of us want to bring that legacy. And I think that's really where we want to focus the end point of the talk is saying, I'm ashamed, really, when we look at these infrastructures that we're leaving behind, that we are not doing a better job of security, that we're not actually developing things out for critical assets, human life, trains, power plants, et cetera. That needs to be a priority. We are ashamed. We understand the cost of failure in society of banks. We know how much money to invest in banking security, but we don't necessarily study the cost of failure of industrial systems infrastructure, and we don't necessarily think about the long-term cost of buying things that can be OEM'd and, and not patched when we need them to be sometime in the future. So we are ashamed, and... We would like you to be ashamed as well. We can all help contribute to this. Um, whether you come from a web pen testing background, we've shown the web vulnerabilities, whether you come from a strong reverse engineering background, this is firmware, you can start pulling apart the binaries and all the rest of it. This is something we can all contribute to help improve essentially the infrastructure that's keeping the lights on in here, that allows this mic to work, that allows us to have this presentation, and all the other good things we're enjoying. We don't mean this in like a DEF CON you should be ashamed of yourselves kind of way. We mean think about the infrastructure that was left to you, right? You were left a legacy of road infrastructure, of train infrastructure, of telephone infrastructure that enabled all of us to come into this room and talk about hacking and security and culture and technology. We were left a legacy. Now when we talk about legacy systems and industrial systems, we say, oh, it's legacy, meaning it's vulnerable and we're screwed. So we want you to reclaim the word legacy. We want you to treat industrial infrastructure as infrastructure and dream of a world where you leave your children a legacy of secure, functional infrastructure. 